I'm Dunham Carr, and I would like to speak to you all for a second. First, I would like to say, know thyself. This is a rule passed on in Western philosophy at the core of self-knowledge and self-help. Know thyself. How do I know myself? Well, these, this is a really good question. So, first of all, I'd like to explain that everyone is related to someone who is worldwide famous, worldwide known. If you think you aren't related to someone that isn't well regarded and famous in history, then you should dig around because I can assure you everyone on this earth is related to someone who is held in high regard and high esteem. So uh, in a sense we are all royal. Not only made of stardust but emboldened in our quest for the light. So what is darkness? Stupidity. I'm not going to say ignorance because ignorance suggests that you have the ability to find out that information and if you assimilate it, you are no longer ignorant. You move on towards your destiny, towards your path, on your life path. However, if you're stupid, you don't even look for that information. When it comes along, you don't care and don't pick up on it. So that is what I mean by darkness. Darkness equates to, to stupidity, essentially. So, what is love? Love is truth. What is truth? Truth is, in its essence, divine energy, divine cosmic force. So, this brings me to how do we know ourselves? Know thyself. So, we learn this through knowing our ancestors. How do we know our ancestors? Through using this information, we can sidestep the repeated detrimental circumstances or energies left over from our ancestors' lives if we know their biographies. Now, no one is a mutt. When I was growing up, I would often listen in on people's conversations at parties or in groups, and they would often wait because they didn't want to offend anyone. They didn't want to say, well, I'm adopted. Who is my family now? Well, that's a good question because they did a study and they found that adopted children actually pick up um, have the same life expectancy, the same types of illnesses, the same uh, behavioral patterns as the family that raised them because those epigenetic markers are then transferred to their adoptive families. Epigenetics is a binary system that turns a gene on or off in the way that it works. So that's the simple explanation. When we alter our environment, we alter our epigenetic code. If you're born with a lot of recessives, recessives are just beneficial mutations being tried out for the species. And that time period that they're tested out is, can last a long time. So you can have a thousand years where a particular set of recessives keeps kind of whirling around attracting one another until it becomes either a dominant trait of the species or it's tossed back into the pool. Not implemented as much. So now when we understand that recessives are just mutations and trying out something that may or may not be beneficial to the species, we realize that Actually, none of us are 100% of anything. There is no such thing as 100% pure human. Over time, we travel. 
we migrate the same group of people in one place usually was not the indigenous none of them were except for people in sub-saharan africa were indigenous to that particular geogra geography all of them have adopted adopted over time different names different strategies they've melded with different groups as they traveled and so all of us are an amalgam of different groups so when i say know thy ancestors know the dozen or two dozen or three dozen versions of your people know their migration pattern know what music and cuisine they ate what music they listened to what rituals they performed get to know that part of yourself because in my experience on my path what I have found is that these are the things that unlock visions and they are the things that resonate with my soul they make me feel whole they give me a home in the world and I think that everyone can have that sense of home in the world and peace in their interpersonal relationships through understanding the vast 5,000 year and further back history of their peoples. So, when I would go to those parties and I would overhear people ask, hey, where do your people come from? Usually what I'd hear was, oh, I'm an American mutt. Which means that, you know, German, Irish, uh, Scottish, maybe some African American, we just don't know. But it's all tossed in there together. And I would like to know, but I don't know. This was before the DNA movement. Now that we've had the DNA movement, everybody are, everybody's responses to that is very interesting because they're having a hard time, it seems, understanding their results. They're saying things like, I don't understand. I always thought I was European. How could I have Middle Eastern markers? Or I don't understand. I always thought that I was Central American. Why do I have European or Asian markers? So these are markers which happen during the migration times. They're also, in some cases, diplomatic markers, quite frankly, because throughout human history, we focus on the wars. We don't often focus on the marriages. And humans have performed marriages for diplomatic reasons. During those diplomatic marriages, they might have come from very far away from one another. In which case you have dramatic gene pool diversity. So what does this mean to physical appearance or the way that we assume about other people and their status in this world. What does this tell us about ourselves when we ourselves learn about our true natures, about our souls, our souls throughout history? Well, This pulls me back to another point. We fuse with our ancestors' experiences through their immortality by opening up these epigenetic markers. They switch off the genes that have laid dormant thanks to industrialization, rationalization, pesticides, chemicals, genetically modified foods, environmental problems, social stresses, even family problems and abuses or uh, dependencies, chemical dependencies, any type of even poverty and famine. All of these things can impact throughout the generations to alter our epigenetics. So how do we reverse that? How do we take that power back into ourselves 
to make us, once again, in charge of our own destinies on this planet. When you look at people in history, and you look at the jobs they did, they weren't described as just one job. Benjamin Franklin was not described as just a printer. He was described as so much more, as a statesman, as a diplomat, as a writer, as a linguist. Just for example, think of the term Renaissance man. Renaissance man implying that you know multiple skills and multiple abilities. That was considered genuine. That that, that in itself was part of, almost of an archetype of innovation and respectable as a career path. No one was telling Thomas Jefferson, lay it off with the innovations already and get back to your paperwork. Stop inventing things. Many of our greatest leaders, I know I've chosen a lot of U.S. presidents or U.S. spokespeople just now, very famous U.S. people, but many of our greatest people on this earth were multifaceted, self-learners, and uh, did not impose limitations on their brilliance. They didn't have those limitations on their time and brilliance and so forth and so on, even though they had no access to technology, which is supposedly time-saving. They didn't have society and government and pressures of economics or any other pressure keeping them from their gifts. So why should we now? If we are to believe that the only people who have brain power, talent, ambition, ability on this planet are the people who are currently successful based on the current way things are run in this planet, then are we only just fuel for their fire? Are, are we all just soylent green to be eaten? What are we? Well, we are people. We are people who have unique ideas. We are people who are able to change the world if we gather together and we share these ideas and we pass them on. If we have the tools to communicate our ideas. Where are these tools? These tools are within us. Is the wonderful knowledge that I have to share with you. So, what I would also like to say is that reincarnation itself is DNA inheritance. In most cases of reincarnation in the East, you often see cases where it is accepted that the person who has had the reincarnation experience is talking about a relative, a relative who's passed. And for a long time, Westerners doubted that. Western academics doubted that because they were like, of course they know their relatives. Of course a two-year-old would know grandma, even though grandma died a year before the two-year-old was born, is the thing. Now, I think very closely that, that reincarnation, not always, but most of the time occurs within family groups. And that family groups, soul groups, and the collective whole, cosmic collective. There are, there are three different kind of events or groups or phenomenons to hang out with. So I'll get to that in a second. Recess, now epigenetic switches open doors to the ancestral memory. And I'd like to explore that further I think that that's what happens with music and color therapies. That's what happens with alternative medicine therapies, is that we basically correct epigenetic markers gone awry. 
So um, it's just like being born with the inability to process a certain vitamin. We change the, we, we, you know, give a certain enzyme and all of a sudden you can eat that food group and you, you can, your, your vitamin is activated and that particular disease goes away because you're able to process that vitamin. So, uh, same thing happens with life purpose, with cognitive abilities, with getting away from any type of uh, mental distraction, with finding your life path. Know thyself. So, final one, final thing to talk about is that the collective one is that bright tunnel of light that we go through when we have those out-of-body experiences in, in, you know, we're almost on the other side. It is a place of omnipresence where you experience and know all and you're at peace and you can make these logical, impartial, detached decisions about going back or staying. Sometimes in that, that tunnel, there are flashes of memories that in our daily lives we've forgotten long ago, but in the film strip of our subconscious they remain ever present, and it's actually pleasurable to watch this reel during a near-death experience. It reminds us of what we've accomplished here, of what we came here to do. But sometimes we pull back from that and we're able to come back renewed in our purpose. And sometimes we realize in that moment of communion with the divine and with all of collective consciousness, we realize that actually we can serve a greater purpose on the other side for those we've loved and cherished and that our place is with them now. So, getting in touch with the ancestors is really about opening up what is within you, as well as opening up a channel that is ever flowing back and forth. Their traces of energies are here. That ancestral family group their traces will always be here. They are like recordings on a video cassette or a CD-ROM or whatever, a DVD. They play out over and over again because there's so much emotion attached to those events. Because there's something that the living need to know still about those historic events. And that's why we have ghosts and spirit contacts and channels and mediums and out-of-body experiences and astral projection and near-death experiences and communion with the divine soul consciousness. That is how we have these moments when the veil is thin between the worlds and we can see into other dimensions is because they have something they want to communicate to us and through us. They want to tell us how to end the cycle, negative cycle of karmas that have plagued the family. They want to tell us how to make ourselves the best version, whatever they didn't do, whatever they didn't finish, however they were perceived. They want us to make the record right for the good of all. And this is part of the Aquarian Age. It is part of time travel. It is part of chrononaut control. Time astronaut control. So, the ancestral spirits are with you all. Now, what is a soul group? The soul group travels together throughout time. The people who you have issues with, you've actually made contracts with them 
to have those issues because things have to play out until things are rectified. We are now in a Jupiter and Libra. It is time for balance and truth and justice and fairness. It is time to set the record straight. And this is the first time, the first time in 2000 years in the age of Aquarius that we are seeing this level of collective contribution throughout the world. The ability for all of us to communicate our soul natures. Now, this has been a very difficult time. In the East, they, they call it the Kali Yug, which is a time of steel. In the West, we call it the Age of Pisces, which is the Age of Christ and the Christian martyrs. However, we're coming into the age of Aquarius, and we're coming into an age where the collective whole must heal one individual at a time. And I have complete and total faith that more and more of us will get on board with this collective ascension and transformation. And this is my small seed that I'm planting, hoping it becomes a great oak and leads you closer and closer to the source of water and life, which will become your journey and your token of enlightenment, your vessel of enlightenment. With the light, there is nothing that visualizers cannot do. And with that, I wish you many blessings. Sat Nam, Namaste. And next time, we will be discussing how Further, how no one is 100% anything. So take care. Thank you for joining me, and I'm Dunham Carr. See you next time for new, old, new age, high tech news. Universal Navigator's go. Yeah.